in this documentary, filmmaker Kevin Douglas Wright randomly selected people born between 1946 and 1953. He asked each of them six different questions. Watch as the answers to these questions tell a story about someone teaching something that has been responsible for destroying people, cities, states, and countries in front of our eyes for hundreds of years. Now, let's meet everyone. My name is Maggie Elliott. My name is Stephen Hi, my name is Gloria. Yeah, I was born in 1953. 1950. I was born in 1950. Oh, and where did you say you were from? Jamaica, born, you, And you were born in Jamaica? Yes. Uh, okay. I was born in Fall River, Massachusetts, uh, and grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, I am second generation. Broward County resident, and then my grandfather bought some land up here in the Deerfield Beach area. Uh, when you when you were younger and you're playing on the playground or after mm -hmm. school or before school, mm -hmm. it was um, a mix of different. Of different kids? A mixed, but like I say in our area, it was predominantly lighter skinned. Right, right. Not, not few full whites, but mostly mixed, mm -hmm. different different shades of, of, of um, you know, mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two families of color came in the area, mm -hmm. but most of them, they weren't there originally mm -hmm. in that particular section. And they were accepted. Um, a lot of them intermarried, like I said, so you have mixed race children who we went to school. Color, color was never an issue. I, poor, rich, white, dark, in between, right. all played together, went to schools together. Grew up knowing my, um, my grandparents, blue-eyed, blonde grandma, mm -hmm. who was one of the sweetest and no, not a lot of money either. Right. They were poor right. people. And um, a lot of them intermarried, Indian, Blacks, mm -hmm. because of the history. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole area was like a, a mixing pot. Right. Um, we never knew prejudice. When you moved to Nebraska, you were around what age? Oh, uh, eight or nine. So eight or nine. You know, were all your friends the same color? Yeah. Or yeah. everyone the same color? Yeah, I grew up in the projects. Now, no one would think there were projects in Omaha, Nebraska, right. but there were. Um, and uh, it's interesting because we grew up poor, but not feeling poor. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say lower middle class, but we were poor. Yeah. Um, I was aware that there was something different about us. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Education. It wasn't until I was in high school or junior high school that I, junior high school that I really became aware of how stark that was, but um, and how telling and how influential that was. But, but there was always a sense that we were we, meaning black folks, um, were a little bit different, had a little bit harder, not a little bit, a lot harder, mm -hmm. yeah. and that was just part of went to a predominantly black grade school, junior high school, and uh, I then switched over to a predominantly white high school because it was college preparatory. It wasn't all bad. It, the Jew, Jewish kids and the black kids, I went to Omaha Central, really got along and really were tight mm -hmm. uh, and hung out together. And I can remember um, just the sense of um, camaraderie mm -hmm. 
uh, between the uh, the two communities. Uh, and uh, was the the Jewish community near the black community? No, 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 no. They were. No, it was. It was. Uh, I were at Thirtieth and uh, Myrtle, which was on the east side, lower east side of town, and they were out west, Seventy okay. Second Street, Seventy mm -hmm. Third Street. So they were quite a distance okay. away. Okay. Um, During the Jim Crow era. Uh, uh, era. Everything was, it was like them and us, uh, okay. okay? And so we grew up on the west side mm -hmm. of the track, mm -hmm. and there were Caucasian Americans mm -hmm. on the east side of the track. Not that many, because you can imagine, you know, Deerfield itself is going on about 75, between 75 and 100 years right, old, right. the case. And so... For them, there were few, you know, everybody was just building one way or the other. And so we knew, for instance, that there were white children over here, black children over here. Right. And it's like we knew where we belonged. And, right. and, and it was not so much for us about uh, the fact that they were here or there, but for us, I get the feeling that it was a, a more a thing of how do I shelter Mm -hmm. my kids and keep them from the ravages of Jim Crow or whatever, <clears throat> okay? And or it was whatever. only black? Only black. Wow. Only black. And were there... No white kids. Were they near or far? White or, kids? Yeah. They were right across here. They and they right never, across. no one ever crossed? No one ever crossed, you wow. know. Jim Crow was just that strict, mm -hmm. okay? Just that strict. As far as playing together with them, no. Um, you know, I was just skeptical, uh, uh, fearful. Uh, I have no control over what happens to you when you're um, someplace else. And mm -hmm. certainly I don't want you to be over there with, mm -hmm. you know, in the White Household when, right. you know, something happens to you. No. Mm -mm. no way. We, we had all sorts of ring games. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we had fruit trees in abundance in our area. It was a very fragile area. I could climb a tree just like a no. big mangoes. What? Yeah. And um, we, our teachers were good mm -hmm. in that they organized things. For instance, plant propagation, uh -huh. learning to grow, because it was predominantly a farming area. So that was part of our lesson. And today I'm so thankful that I was taught how to grow things. I think every child should have that opportunity. Um, that was part of it, growing, growing things and of course harvesting and enjoying it. Uh, we had 4-H, you must have heard of 4-H, that came in and taught us all sorts of skills like um, animal husbandry and what have you. It was good.
swim, I like the ocean, I garden a lot. And part of the love for gardening came from primary school days when they taught us plant propagation, how to grow things, how to be survivors, you know, and being in 4-H club and all of that. You learn the basic life skills in, in how to survive. So that was wonderful. As I mentioned earlier, we were a coastal area, we weren't far from the sea. So a treat for us on Sundays was my father would load us up, load us up in the car and take us down to the river, which is right. And oh, that was so beautiful. And of course, it was like a picnic because all, <laughs> nearly everybody's related. It was like a, a potluck. We would fry fish or cook and everybody would sort of sit and enjoy. And then the children would go sw swim. And once in a while, we'd get a boat ride from the fishermen. We would go out and oh, was idly. We didn't know anything about color. We didn't know anything about racism. Mm -hmm. It was non-existent. Uh, do for fun, like uh, activities, or games, or marbles, um, hide and seek, the usual stuff. But my um, my mother was real enlightened, um, and so her thing was, you know, you're going to study. Mm -hmm. You're going to get good grades, you're going to apply yourself, you're going to do right, um, and you're going to represent the family right. So, um, like I said, I'd hit the library. Um, I had folks that um, I hung out with and party and played with, but that was after, yeah, after homework and hitting the books mm -hmm. and uh, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's what, what we did. did. You know, we, we um, and I, and I shot marbles until I was 16 years old. That's probably why my knees. <laughs> but, um, you know, not only we, did we shoot marbles, uh, you know, we did hopscotch. A uh, fun game for us in the house was jacks. Yeah. If we were in the house or, or whatever. Uh, but if you were out on the streets, uh, there was one cardinal rule in my daddy's house. You had to be on the inside before the street lights came on, yes. and so, <laughs> so regardless of whether or not you know you 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 got your point or whatever, and you're down on the ground shooting marbles, and you know you get a chance to win, and that street light you know approached you, <laughs> you just yeah. darted in the house. Your, your earliest memory of someone pointing out that yeah, the there's that there's a difference between being black and being white. Did you feel you're black and that's a difference? Like your earliest memory? My earliest memory was in first form in high school when we started to do history. Mm -hmm. And I started to study about the slave trade and realize where and because prior to that, I never identified myself with any color. Yeah. You know, I was just a human being having fun, somewhere light or somewhere dark, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. There was love and there was respect. But when I realized, and by the time I went to high school, of course there was, you would see more people, you would expand your horizons, mm -hmm. and then you'd understand a little more what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, it was history that opened so, my eyes. And one of the things that um, happened to me that is burned in my mind, um, I was in the ninth grade and uh, my teacher, who was white, at a predominantly all black junior high school, asked the class uh, a question. If um, boys join a fraternity, what do girls join? I had never heard of fraternity or sorority. So I said maternity. Seemed like it was clever and it was just something that women did. Well, she had found out that I had applied to a college preparatory high school and she stood me in front of the class and told me that I was too dumb to study with white kids and that um, I needed to think about 
uh, staying where I was and doing what I was doing. And uh, it's interesting, after that, um, she ended up eventually becoming a principal at an all-black high school. And uh, to this day, I wonder about how many lives uh, and hopes were dashed, how many careers were ru ruined by this, uh, this woman. I, on the other hand, went to a predominantly white um, high school, um, got A's and B's to prove her wrong, and then like most knuckleheads, um, started goofing around a little bit, but my grades were maintained enough that um, uh, I got a scholarship um, uh, as a result of a black social worker named Rodney Reed and a white Jewish um, graduate rabbi, uh, Rubenstein, uh, who had attended Columbia University um, to compete for a scholarship to Columbia University. And uh, not only did I get the scholarship, but um, I also had a chance to go to any Ivy League school of my choice as a result of that. So, um, but the notion that uh, somehow I wasn't smart enough, um, it, stayed, it stayed with me. And what I learned from that was that I had, if I was going to apply myself and be successful, I had to work twice as hard as uh, as the white boys uh, in order to uh, achieve the same level of, of success. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think back to when that teacher did that, do you remember uh, exactly how you felt? Like, did you did you did you have any kind of response, or you were frozen because it shocked you, or I was I was angry. Mm -hmm. um, and I, to this day, I don't know why I didn't act out. Um, because of the maybe more emotional thing would have been to uh, to do something outrageous mm -hmm. and uh, run out of the classroom or strike her or cuss her out or whatever. But none of that uh, none of that really occurred to me. Uh, I went home and I told my mother. And her response was very practical. And she says, I don't give a damn what the teacher said. <laughs> you go in the books, go study. Uh, and um, <laughs> I listened to my mama, and it worked out all right. <laughs> but you know, you right. know black mama's kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, when my father would take us, uh, about 55, we got a car. And uh, he wanted to go to Georgia to see his mother and, you know, uh, other relatives. And I could never understand why we had to stop along the road and couldn't stop and eat. We had to pack everything. Uh, and if you had to relieve yourself, you had, <laughs> you had to stop along the road and go in the woods because you didn't dare try to stop to a filling station or whatever just to relieve yourself, you know, let alone eat someplace one way or the other. So you, if you were going from here to Georgia to visit my uh, father's folks, you had to have everything prepared. Lord forbid if the car should break down along the road or whatever, so that car had to be in immaculate cons uh, condition mm -hmm. just the whole nine yards. And I never could understand that, you know, why? Um, but, um, Still, I never, never thought racism was never in my mind. You know, it wasn't until I I got older, and then you started to hear things, and you started to see, and you started to question why is it so? Mm -hmm. You know. When you think back to when that when that teacher did that. Do you remember any of their reactions from the students, the other students? Just the, laughter. Just laughter. Yeah, they, you know, she's just cracking on you. Um, and, um, but I just remember her saying it, and my reaction, initial reaction, was hatred and um, anger. And um, to this day, I, I don't know why, like I said, I didn't react differently. Um, but my training and my upbringing 
um, served me well. Right. right. When we were growing up, because of segregation, uh, the colleges, the, 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 the HBCUs mm -hmm. would come to the various schools, the various black uh, schools, they make their presentation. And while I was at one of those presentations, there was a, little, there was a lady, uh, she's uh, passed now, Mary, yeah, I never will forget, who came to uh, present for Bennett College. And I said, I think I was in 11th grade at that time, and I said, that's where I want to go to school. Wow. Okay? Now, you got to understand this. You know, you look at my complexion, mm -hmm. okay? And I looked in their yearbook, and basically, I saw people of color, but they were of color like you and lighter okay. or whatever the case may be. And so, to bring it back around to you, when I came back home from Howard, I met one of my teachers who said to me, Oh, Gloria. I understand you did very well for yourself. I said, yes, it depends upon what you call well. Well, when I heard you got into Bennett College, uh, and then you pledged AKA, and look at your skin color. Wow. Do you know how that made me feel? Yeah. You know, out of all that I've done, right, right. here's one of my teachers telling me this. Mm -hmm. What did what did you expect mm -hmm. of me? Yeah, and I have no doubt that some of us and 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 the courts have proved it uh, here in later years that there is discrimination between mm -hmm. lighter skin and darker and, skin. And your facts, teacher was what, what, what very fair. Very fair. <laughs> she was very. Fair. But she was considered black American. Yes, she black was. American. Yes, she was. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was. Yes. So that happened in my first year in high school when we started to study history. And it was a rude awakening because my grandma was blonde with blue eyes, my father was blonde with blue eyes, my mother was mixed black and Indian and a little Chinese somewhere in the mix. But I grew up thinking I was white because everybody, so many people around was white. And then I, I said, but I am black. And then I started to figure, well, black with Indian and Chinese. But, you know, in the, the rule of thumb from slavery is that if you have one drop of black blood, you're black. It doesn't matter. Your parents could be white and black mixed. You are still black. It doesn't matter. But I embrace that. The more of us, the merrier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, um, <clears throat> when I look back, on one side of my family, my grandfather was full blood Blackfoot Sioux. Mm -hmm. So they stole the land from them. And my father, of course, uh, on my mother's side was uh, African. So not only did folks come over and take the land from one side of the family, but then brought the rest of us over to work the land uh, from the other side of the family. So. There was a theater. We couldn't go to it. It was a drive-in theater. But what we could do, we could sit on the cars or sit in the yard and watch. We never heard the right, sound, right. but we could see the same movies so that they saw. It was a drive-in. Drive you know, we didn't have the right to go there because we were African American. Were there actually signs there that said you couldn't, or everyone just knew? Everybody just knew. Everyone just knew. Everybody just knew. So okay. no one actually. Nobody challenged yeah, it. Right, we right. just you know, do what we had to do, right. basically. Yeah. And I think you'll find that with a lot of people um, in my age and, and especially in this um, in the South, mm -hmm. uh, we knew what the boundaries were. Um, I always like to think, and I tell people all the time, I could never have been a slave. Right. Because I probably would have been a rebellious slave. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you start questioning, yeah. kids question as to why. Mm -hmm. Well, mommy, why can't we go over there and hear the sound? Right. What a hush girl, you know. Right. right. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we lived with that. Another thing happened was one day, you know, us black girls, we like to play with our hair. We wear wigs, we wear hair places, we do what all sorts of things. And one day I decided to wear this extra curly thing. You know, it's pretty, it was neat, it was clean. In the morning meeting, the general man manager looked at me and said, who would want to spend time with her? I was so mad, but I had to enter, enter, I had to keep it inside. I couldn't vent because he, I needed my job. 
I was good at what I did. But how dare him because of my hairstyle? No, you know, and I, I was a, a proven producer. What was, what was his background? He was... His, he was from... You know what? I wouldn't be surprised if he was not one of those KKK guys. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised. But he, he was white American. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The rest of the people in the meeting, did anyone... How did they take it? In all fairness, there was one guy who was from Sicily, an Italian. And he said, no, you can't do that. That's not right. I remember him distinctly saying that. He was the only one that stood up. The rest were like little sheep going or ducks going in a row. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a whisper. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, I became sick. And I think a lot of it is because of the pressure too. When, when you have stress, it can manifest itself in illnesses. And I developed some serious illnesses and eventually I had to resign. And right as I realized, well, I can't work any longer, I'm going to take care of this guy. I wrote to the EEOC and explained in detail what transpired, not only to me, but to other people of color. I remember there was a manager there when I went there and she was back, she was from Jamaica also. And the minute he came in, he, he demoted her. He demoted her. She was somebody who was in the company, a good producer, a nice person, but he, you know, he wanted his management staff to be all white. I got a letter from them that it was in, he was investigated and he, two weeks after I left, he was fired. He was told, they went in their office and said, you have five minutes to pack your things. So that was sweet justice, mm -hmm. you know, as far as I'm concerned, but still the hurt and that mental pain to some extent is worse than physical pain. If he had slapped me, it would have cooled off. But to do something like that to someone, it stays with them through life. Mm -hmm. You know, not that it's going to diminish my belief in myself, but it is something that it makes me a little more cautious right. in dealing with others. And sometimes you might be wrong by saying, oh, you know, shying away from a situation that might be perfectly good. But because of that experience, you know, it made right. me cautious. Let, let me... Uh, uh, let me tell you, about 10 years ago, um, I was head of an organization set up by Corporate America to provide ways for minority businesses to do business with Corporate America and to buy entities called the National Minority Supply Development Council. We had a um, chapters all over the place. We had 43 chapters when I started. Um, and it was basically trying to level the playing field so that a black or a Latino or Asian Native American. We have all the major car companies, Microsoft, AT&T, all these folks were members of the organization. <clears throat> and Toyota had just built a manufacturing facility in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the president of our local operation down there worked with Toyota to open up opportunities for minority businesses. <clears throat> and Toyota was now opening a facility in Tupelo, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So I was asked to fly down and um, I said, okay, but I had to go to Hope, I had to go to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas first. So I said, look, I called National Car Rental. I said, now I'm gonna rent a car because I gotta drive to Tupelo, Mississippi. I said, I don't want any nonsense. I want a GPS system and give me a Ford. Give me something. So I got down there and they said, Mr. Sims, we got good news and bad news for you. The good news is we got your car. The bad news, it was a candy apple red Hummer. And I'm picturing myself driving through the South in this candy apple red Hummer. Um, but that's all they had. So um, I'm driving along and I'm calling a white guy who's a friend of mine that I worked with, a guy named Jim, who's up in the national headquarters, because I want somebody to know where I am. <clears throat> and the radio towers at that time were terrible, so it kept breaking up. And he was laughing so hard when I told him what happened, and I finally had to threaten to kill him. I said, listen to me. So he listened, I said, here's where I am, here's the junction I am, I went five miles below the speed limit there, I get there, 
And the woman who was head of my chapter in Austin had come in because she was going to do technical assistance to local minority businesses mm -hmm. and the organization there. Uh, and she was uh, American Indian, but she looked white. So <clears throat> she says, uh, and we got through it, she says, look, um, we got to leave tomorrow afternoon. Can I ride back to you, with you, to Little Rock, Arkansas? I said, no. She says, look, I'm thinking, I just lay down in the seat. I said, not only no, but hell no. Because if the police stop me and your head pops up, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. And so uh, I wasn't laughing. I said, not only no, but stay away from my car. Don't go near that car. And so um, we both went both back to our cities and we laughed about it later on. But at the time, I was serious as cancer. Don't, don't, don't put me in that position. That's America. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't think ahead, if you don't plan, if you don't process stuff, by accident, you get caught up in this. this we, don't, we don't know what color. We, we don't know what color. color those prejudices. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, my earliest memories would have to be um, grade school mm -hmm. uh, when we question, you know, why are these books coming to us and they're all written on and the pages are torn out or whatever the case is. Why can't we have books like the other kids one way or the other, you know? Mm -hmm. And back then, I, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those books, they always had a, a page where you can write your name in it because mm -hmm. uh, they passed the books along, but after it got so tattered or whatever, that's what we would get. And so if there was like a legend for 10 names, the 10 names were all written in there so you could see the names, but you didn't know who they were one way or the other, you know. However, there was a disparity with the darker skinned children not getting the advantage to go to a higher education. Okay. Number one, the cost of it, although some of them had the ability, the parents couldn't afford like the uniforms and the transportation to go out of the area to right. school. The only Portuguese I remember was Papa Causa, which I'm told yes. means go home. Uh, <laughs> and so, and that was, I was four or five or six at the time. So uh, clearly people wanted to get rid of me even at a young age. You know, it's, you know, it's just some of those things. And, and, and you knew, we knew that we couldn't come across these tracks. Mm -hmm. And so we never did. Mm -hmm. All right, after high school, I applied to a bank in Kingston, mm -hmm. and I got the job. And um, there were very, very few darker skinned people mm -hmm. in those days working in the bank. And I didn't see this ad myself, but I was told that there was an ad in the newspaper for banking positions, but you had to be light skinned. And I said to myself, now I'm coming. So when, when you applied, you didn't know that that... I didn't know. Uh -huh. I was accepted right away. Was the interview process, did you feel it was easy or... Did you... It was easy. Mm -hmm. It was easy. And um, I felt that I was looked upon as being privileged because I was probably a little lighter. And it bothered me because by then I had had friends who were very dark and mm -hmm. arranged and I couldn't understand why society had to do something like that. Right. You know? Omaha was the kind of place, uh, there's a place called Peony Park that up until the time I left Omaha, black folks weren't allowed into. It was an amusement park not located far from downtown. And um, we just weren't allowed to go there. And surprise, surprise, my last full-time job I had, I had to go there to speak because we had a, uh, I was involved in minority business department, we had a chapter there. And I was to give a speech. Where? At Peony Park. So I had a chance to go there and talk about Omaha, Nebraska, always getting ready to do right by us. And, uh, it's kind of rewarding wow. to uh, to close that loop. Mm -hmm. And when I came back here, and about how old were you when you when you were? I was twenty six when mm -hmm. I came back home. 
Okay, and when I came back here, I have no doubt that some of those jobs that I applied for were given to other people because they were strictly white Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had no greater qualifications. I came back, I already had a master's degree. I already had, uh, you know, work experience under my belt and the whole nine yards. And you look up and somebody else got the job.